Um, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Bogdan Atanasov. I teach prehistoric archaeology at the New Bulgarian University in Sofia. And on behalf of uh, the Balkan Heritage Foundation and the New Bulgarian University, uh, who organize these online lectures on the archaeology of the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean, I would like to welcome you to our third lecture this year, uh, <clears throat> which will be given by uh, Professor Philip Stockhammer <clears throat> from the University of Munich and myself. And uh, we'll be talking about um, power ar architecture or architecture of power, the late Bronze Age site of Bresto in Southwest Bulgaria. Um, I will uh, do some introductory words then we will hold the lecture. <clears throat> First, Philip will talk, and then uh, I will uh, continue. It will not be a long uh, presentation uh, because we uh, count with uh, vivid discussion. So please uh, note your questions. And after the lecture, we would like to hear your question in person or if you prefer, you can write it in chat. Philip Stockhammer is professor for prehistoric archaeology with a focus on the Eastern Mediterranean at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and co-director of the Max Planck Harvard Research Center for the Archaeoscience of the Ancient Mediterranean. In 2008, he learned his PhD at the University of Heidelberg, where we uh, met and we became good friends. He continued to work as a postdoctoral researcher at Heidelberg until 2016. Uh, then he became associate professor at the University of Basel. Uh, and in 2015, uh, before he received received the ERC Consolidator Grant. He's the primary investigator and a co-primary uh, in investigator of several collaborative research projects on the Bronze and Early Iron Age in Central and Southeastern Europe. And you have the chance to see some of the results of analysis which were carried in the framework of this project. Philip's research focuses on the transformative power of intercultural encounter, social practices, and the integration of archaeological and scientific data with regards to social belonging, mobility, food, and health. Moreover, he is also very engaged in public outreach, being actively involved in the production of documentaries as well as video games. Yes, video games informing broad audiences about latest archaeological research. Philip edited 10 volumes, published two books, and is currently writing on a third book, uh, which will be devoted, guess what, to Bresto. And 144 articles, uh, 44, 45 of them peer reviewed. Um, now I will pass the floor to Philip. Uh, and as we said, um, looking very much forward to uh, the discussion which will follow. Philip, the floor is yours. Bogdan, thanks so much for your kind introduction and thanks for everybody for joining in the morning, the afternoon, the evening or where, whatever time zone it is where you are. We are most happy to have you with us for this hour to show you a little, give you some insight in the side of Presto where Bogdan and I have been working now for over 10 years and which is a, a site that always fascinates and also surprised us from the very beginning. And we hope that we can share a little bit of the fascination and 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 love that we have for Bresto with you this evening and give you some idea. However, we decided not just to speak about Bresto in, in but but bring it under an overall question that we think where Bresto can really contribute to a larger discussion in archaeology. And I'm sharing my screen now and I hope you can every Bogdan, can everybody see the screen? Yeah. 
And we thought to frame it under the title, the, architect, the, the architecture of power or the power of architecture. And the 13th and 12th century BC settlement of Bresto in southwestern Bulgaria. However, before we start with the interplay of architecture and power, let me let us dive together into Europe and then into southeastern Europe and this little uh, village or, or little area, this tiny place there in the midst of the mountains in southern Bulgaria called uh, Bresto. You can see on the left, we are uh, just above the borderline between Greece and Bulgaria, and we are in the midst of the mountains. And then you see on the right, this tiny yellow circle. It's the place where the site of Presto is situated in the uh, Rodopi Mountains. So the site of Presto in the midst of the mountains is situated on the slope of a hill that you can see. Bogdan, can one see my mouse if I move the mouse? So you see here it's on the slope of a hill, and this is in a, in, in a sinuosity of the river Istok. Nowadays, behind the slope, there's a big road, but this road is a 20th, early 20th century construction. For this, the uh, upper part of the uh, mountain was dynamited away. So Bresto looks like an isolated slope, but originally it was connected with the mountain behind. And we excavated on this slope uh, as it became clear when we started in 2012 that already before us, looters had been very active. So at the very beginning, it was clear. This is a very interesting side of the second millennium. And when we started already in the first year, we found this two meter wide fortification wall, which on the basis of numerous radiocarbon dates and the stratigraphy, we could date to the 12th and 11th century BC. And this at, at this time, it was almost like it was a complete surprise. No one would have thought that somewhere in the mountains of southern Bulgaria in the 12th century, someone would build such a massive fortification wall that is basically without comparison, not only in the vicinity, but also in the broader region. So this uh, raised all these questions. What what does it mean such a uh, fortification wall? Does it mean, does it point towards a concentration of some kind of power in some place in the middle of the mountains? Why did people erect such a massive architectural structure at this, at least from our perspective, very remote place? And what was the function? Was it just a fortification or did the function of this wall go beyond the mere protection? So many questions that we had already in the first year which motivated us a lot to continue working at the site of Bresto. So these are the questions that are basically the basis of our today's presentation. Architecture of power or the power of architecture. What do we mean? So possibility one, is the massive fortification of Bresto a result of social stratification and concentration of power? Or to say it more bluntly, there was a leader who said, <laughs> I want to have a great fortification. Let's build a fortification at Bresto. Or alternatively, was the massive fortification of Bresto a communal effort saying people came together of different backgrounds, a heterogeneous community, and they decided to communally together build this wall and basically building this wall shaped them as a community. So was the A would be the wall, is an expression of the power of an elite. And B would be, it's the power of building the wall, the pros of building the wall that had the power to shape the community of Presto. So these are the two hypotheses that we want to further elucidate with our lecture in the following. So another look at Presto to just give you an idea how Presto is situated in the space and also in the broader region. If you look here, you see this is quite a hilly area there in southern Bulgaria. You see the mountains of the Pyrene, the Rila and the Rodopis and the Pyrene mountains, I think, reach up to 3000 meters, if I'm correct, Bogdan. So this is quite a mountain range. And so if you wanted to go 
to reach from the Aegean to the north to the Danube Basin, you had to follow basically the river lines, which were the easiest way to pass the mountains. And on the left, you see the river valley of the Struma, where is still the major highway from Sofia, if you want to come to the beaches of Greece, with horrible traffic on the weekends. And an alternative road would have been via the Mester Valley. And you see um, Brestos very close to the Mester Valley. And if you followed up, you would reach the so-called Maritza Valley, which which is a big valley place in central Bulgaria that was settled from the very early beginning onwards. So again, to Bresto, you see an, an aerial photograph taken with the drone and you see how our site, the site of our excavation, we only excavated on the lower part of the slope. It was a collaboration of Bogdan Atanasov and myself together with Ilya Kulo from the Historical Museum of Blagoevgrad, who also discovered the site. To give you a short idea how, where we are, so our chronology is based on 19 uh, radiocarbon dates from stratified short-lived samples. And uh, we have, which is lucky for us, two big fire destructions, one at the end of phase one, one of the end of phase two. You know, people are always unhappy if their settlement breaks down. Archaeologists are happy if settlements break down in catastrophic events because this gives us the wonderful preservation of in situ floor contexts. So we see the first phase of Presto on the basis of these radiocarbon dates can be dated, let's say, 1300, 1260 to around 1200, 1180. And then there's no hiatus. We can see from, there was no erosion processes, no hiatus. The settlement was immediately rebuilt around after the destruction. So from 1200, 1180, and the second phase is until 1120, 1050. So for those people who are not already trained archaeologists in the public, let me give you a short insight what happened during these times. So this first time slot, so the 13th century, the time of Ramses II in Egypt was marked by the big uh, uh, kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean. You see the Mycenaean uh, area with the big palaces of Mycenae, Tyrans, Pilus. We see the empire of the Hittites in Anatolia, the Assyrian empire in Mesopotamia, and of course, the Egyptian empire in Egypt. And they had all also conquered the Levant. So at the very time where Bresta was built, Ramses II erected his famous uh, temples in Egypt, like here. Abu Simbel. I have to admit that Bresto is not as spectacular, but nevertheless, it's the same time, you know. But I have to tell you, we didn't find any spectacular statues like this at the site. But to give you a feeling what happened during this time in the Eastern Mediterranean. At the same time, we have Hittite Anatolia, also with massive and representative architecture. As you see on the bottom on the left side, you see the Lion Gate of Hattusha, the capital of the Hittites, and you see this massive um, place of Hattusha with these large uh, palaces and storage facilities uh, close to Ankara and central Anatolia. And similar to Egypt, Hittites wrote a lot and a lot of uh, tablets with writing were preserved of this period. And of course, in Greece, similarly, we have these splendid Mycenaean palaces. You see the wonderful reconstructions drawing of the early 20th century from the excavation of the Palace of Pylos. We have so-called Linear B tablets, an early version of Greek that we can read and understand how the administration in these palaces worked. And on the left side, you see a small ivory head of, a, of one of these warriors, these mighty warriors of Mycenaean Greece. I don't want to call him Agamemnon, but you know, one of these mighty warriors wearing a boar tusk helmet, you know, and of course, if you want to be a mighty warrior, you have to cure all these wild boars. And um, I give you an advice, if you encounter wild boar, don't try to kill the wild boar. There's a higher chance that the wild boar will kill you instead. So, uh, but if you were a mighty Mycenaean warrior, you were showing that you are so mighty and strong by having the, the, the boars of the male adult boar, uh, wild boars cut into lamellas on your leather helmet. So, and then around 1200, everything breaks down in the Eastern Mediterranean. The palaces in Greece are destroyed. We have big, uh, the Hittite Empire disappears within a short period of time. A lot of Levantine cities got destroyed. And it's the time of the so-called 
sea peoples that are also known from the Bible as the Philistines or part of the sea peoples were those Philistines. And you see one of these most popular reconstruction drawings on the left. So in Presto, we really spend this time. We have the first, we get the 13th century, the, the peak of early globalization and empires and connectedness. And then Presto breaks down at the same time where everything breaks down in the Eastern Mediterranean. But whereas the palaces of the Greek of Greece are never rebuilt, Presto is rebuilt immediately. So these so-called sea peoples, you know, they raided the Eastern Mediterranean. And then it was Pharaoh Ramses III who wrote in his uh, temple facade of Medinet Habu, was his uh, temple close to his burial, where he showed in the relief that he, you know, standing there with his bow and arrow, was killing the sea peoples on the ship that tried to invade the Nile Delta. So we see the 12th century is a time of social transformations with a lot of mobilities where groups of people of different origin and different motivations, you know, we're basically uh, wandering around in the Eastern Mediterranean. We see also on the right side, you see the so-called warrior race found in Mycenae in the 12th century. And we have to assume that also in Greece, we saw bands of warriors, warlords, raiding places, people like in Crete, leaving the settlements on the, on the coastlines, going up, build refugee settlements up in the mountains. And in these kind of transformative times, you know, we see where Bresto is situated and can contribute to a better understanding of these most interesting times in the second millennium in the Eastern Mediterranean. So what do we have? And I have to admit, it's more humble than the palaces of the Eastern Mediterranean, but it's not less uninteresting because it's really for the first time that stratified, uh, set, set, stratified settlement and uh, impressive architecture of this time was excavated in southern Bulgaria. So we see here in Oberlife a lot of stone architecture, and you can already see names like Terrace Wall 2, uh, then you see House 2, two-faced fortification wall, and an upsidal building. And these are four structures that I will speak a little bit more about in the uh, next 10 minutes or so. So I will first speak about phase one, this is the 13th century, where we have this so-called terrace wall, an 18 meter long, fantastic terrace wall uh, built of massive stones and house two that is also belongs to this earlier phase. And then of the second phase of the 12th century, we have this, what I showed in the beginning, this massive fortification wall together with an exceptional upsidal building. So this is our final planum that we produced. And you see, it, it needs some time to look into it. And for example, we see that the house two of the earlier phase was partly built over by the later uh, two-faced fortification wall. So in the 13th century, what we see in Presto, this, they did a lot of effort to transform the slope into something where people could live. So they were cutting away the stone. They were building big terrace walls. And you ask yourself, why? You know, there's so much space nearby where you don't need to transform a slope into something like terraces, you know? Why on earth did people make the effort to transform a slope into terraces when just a kilometer away you have the basin of Raslok where you don't need any transformation? You just have flat places where you can build a settlement. You know, there is, there's some agenda behind that people, um, that people had. You see this quite massive terrace wall where of still 80 meters of it are preserved. And it's also interesting that this massive long terrace wall, you see uh, the outline of it painted, uh, redrawn in yellow, has offsets in stone, which are from a construction point of view, completely unnecessary. So you have to ask why did people at this time in the 13th century construct a stone wall with offsets? And then you look to the south and to the east, and then you see that's not so unusual. At the very same time, we have the late Bronze Age fortification of Troy. And if you look at the wall here to the left, you see the same offsets in stone, you know, where you ask yourself, how much is done for the optics? How much is construct uh, constructive uh, 
because of stability. This can be discussed, but what, what the point is, it's a constructive element that is not only limited to the Bulgarian mountains. And it's also, if you look to the right, Tyrion's late Bronze Age, uh, it's the top, the so-called upper, upper citadel where the palace once stood, and you see the fortification wall. And again, if you see my mouse, you see again the offsets in the wall that were characteristic for the for the settlement. So for the, for the fortification wall. So this is really fascinating that in the middle of the Bulgarian mountains, we have a construction technique of a wall that is in accordance to what we know at the same time from uh, the areas to the south. Of course, the lucky fierce fire destruction of the first settlement phase, uh, lucky for us, as I said in the beginning, left a lot of traces in situ. So we have, for example, intact house floor of this house too, with grain concentrations, spindle walls, pottery, as you said. And uh, what you also can see here is um, burned wall plaster. So what you see is really, we have the construction of the building, the mud that was pushed at the at the wall at the wooden construction you know to make the wall this burns so hard that we now have basically we can really reconstruct to a large extent how this building was constructed but what also fascinated me a lot is what we found this building was not only used for living storing grain having pottery but we also find spindle walls so uh, obviously pottery was produced as well as half finished bortusk lamella so you see here on the left, you see a boar tusk of a wild boar cut already into pieces. And then in the center, what you see here are lamellas for boar tusks already with drilled holes. So what we see here is that in the middle of the mountains, people hunted wild boars, cut boar tusk lamellas and probably sold them to the Mycenaean Greek warriors. So that the mighty warriors of Mycenae if they were not so mighty, but nevertheless wanted to have a boar tusk helmet, ah, oh, you know, you make it a little bit easier and you have your people where you can buy your boar tusks from the Southern Bulgarian mountains. So it's fascinating, nowhere in the Aegean, we have a workshop for boar tusk helmets. The only workshop known comes from the middle of nowhere, at least from a present day perspective in the Bulgarian mountains. So isn't it fascinating how our own perspective of remoteness is completely different from the past where obviously Bresto was very well connected in architecture as I could show you. And now with these Bortas Glamellas with the Ichian, for us in the beginning, we thought this is a remote place in the middle of nowhere. For the people of the 13th century, Bresta was well connected and node in these networks in the, in the Aegean and beyond. At the same time, it was not only boar tusks that were produced at Bresto, but also what you can see is, is, um, is a bone pins produced from antlers, deer antlers. And we see that at Bresto, they continuously collected deer antler and then we have all the different stage of fabrication for example in the center you see such an antler piece with cut marks you can see these cut marks here and we have antler pieces where, where lamellas were, 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 were cut out so we can see every step of the chain apportoire for the production of these bone pins that you see on the left side basically almost all of the same time and many of them were, up, were broken and obviously broke in the process of production. So we really see this 13th century uh, side of Bresto was very vivid in producing, working with the local resources, deer antler, boar tusks, to produce things for the Aegean, because also these uh, bone pins are found all over the northern Aegean and all the different sites. So as I said, Bresto was destroyed around 1200. And I would love to know what happened. You know, it was a horrible fire. We didn't see any victims in the houses, but I mean, we don't have so many houses. So maybe at least from the house that we had, the people could flee, but they left everything there on the floor. And then what they did immediately afterwards, they leveled the site and then they built this massive fortification wall that I've shown in the very beginning that we discovered at the very beginning of our excavation already in 2012, as it was just below the ground. You see, this is now the phase two of Presto, just starting immediately after 1200. Beside this massive fortification wall, the other fantastic evidence 
was an upsidal building and you see it in dark blue on the on the drawing how you can imagine this building uh, with a, a length of more than seven meters it's horribly destroyed you see uh, the the lower part we had a lot of pits of the first millennium late iron age pits that destroyed part of it but what we can see here already is the floor of the building and what you can see here are the last traces of the massive packages of burnt wall plaster that was found in situ on the floor. You cannot imagine how much wall plaster also of this building we found. You can even see it here. We found complete walls, complete walls that just collapsed to the side where you can see how the whole construction was made with the wooden beams, you know, how it was interwoven with sticks. It was it was wonderful to have. It was a nightmare to prepare to preserve to take it out, and and also to store it. To be honest, you know, if you have tons of these walls, how can you store them? How can you how can you preserve and document them? And we are very proud that in Munich with Alexander von Kienin, we have one of the world leading specialists who is working with us on the on the on the evaluation of this fantastic evidence because i at least to our knowledge there's hardly any place in prehistoric europe where you have such a large amount of burnt wall plaster which helps you to really reconstruct past wooden and uh, and wooden and uh, mud architecture so such kind of upsidal buildings are nothing that is that it's known from a large area between Romania and northern Greece. But we have to be aware that these upsidal buildings are always something special. That's not the normal space where you live. But we just want to say this is a space, a kind of architecture again, which links Presto to the larger area of the southeastern Europe and the Aegean. So this connectedness that we could see in the 13th century doesn't get lost in in the 12th century. And this is even more so what we can see it for the non-specialist. It might look like what kind of pottery is this? What is it? Something special? Yes, it is. It's a so-called alabastron, a so-called Mycenaean pottery shape that um, based on our neutron activation analysis, this vessel was not made in the Bulgarian mountains, but probably in the area of Thessaloniki. That's where the closest parallels from a clay composition wise came from. It dates to the 13th century. It was found in Bresto in a 12th, 11th century context. So you can ask, when was it brought to Bresto? Already in the 13th century, survived the destruction of the site and was continuously used in the 12th century. Or was it, you know, did some vessel that already was 50 years old was then traded to Bresto in the 12th century? We don't know. But what we know is that these kind of vessel shapes, these alabastron, these pixies, or however you want to call it, it was used in the in the Aegean traditionally for some kind of unguent, some kind of creams, you know. So if you want your nice skin, you have your day cream, you know, and then you with your fingers you can put it out and put it on your face, body, or whatever. But to understand this better, um, one of our team members undertook organic chemical, organic residue analysis. And we found a very interesting combination. We found animal fats, not a surprise because uh, fats are the basis for any kind of cream in, at the time. It could be either olive oil or in this case, it's animal fat. But we also found millet traces. So the chemical traces of millet, milliacin. And it's very improbable that someone ate millet stew from a vessel that has an opening of whatever, three centimeters, you know, no spoon would fit inside. But what is interesting that the shape of the vessel is very similar to, I would say, baggy shaped drinking vessels of the time. So our hypothesis is it came as a vessel for anguin, some kind of whatever, uh, aromatic uh, body cream from the Aegean to Bresto. And after it was empty, they used it for drinking millet beer because its shape was very much resembling the local drinking vessels. And I think this is very interesting to get an idea how intercultural contact could transform and uh, the meaning of vessels and their function in ever new ways. And this is, Wessel shows us how dynamic the interaction between the Aegean and this uh, settlement in Southern Bulgaria was. So this is what I wanted to present you from the side of Presto. And now Bogdan will continue with the discussion of the side. And so Bogdan, I would ask you to continue and give us a bit of a context of what we just saw for Presto. Thank you. Uh, as every excavation, 
uh, once you dig, you come to so many questions. Uh, and Philip gave you an idea uh, how many questions uh, we faced in Bresto. And the best way to try to answer them is to see what's uh, happening on uh, in the broader context. Uh, and um, the area where we get uh, the most information is uh, Central Greek Macedonia. Uh, it's a place where we find many tail sites. So for those who are not familiar with the term, tail site means a settlement mount which consists of remains from uh, consequent uh, settlement constructions. And one of the most important, probably the, the biggest uh, and uh, uh, like the most important tail sites is the Tumba uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, in Thessaloniki, Thermaic Gulf uh, uh, site on uh, or near the seaside. And what you can see on this uh, fantastic reconstruction to the left is that you have an upsidal building for this tail site. The upsidal buildings were rather the uh, uh, common type, but also you see terrace walls. So the idea of terracing, which uh, exists on these tail sites, uh, uh, much earlier, so we have upsidal buildings from the third millennium BC. This is the early Bronze Age, and terrace wall, at least from the middle Bronze Age. So this idea of terracing was appropriated from uh, the south, but there is a huge difference. These terraces was not made out of stone. Sometimes there was stones used, but even if stones was used, uh, the entire terrace never consists uh, entirely of stones as we have it in Bresto. What you can see on the right photograph, which is not very good, is a building in the neighboring valley of uh, Struma Strimon. The river has two names, the one is the Greek, the other is the Bulgarian. Uh, and this building, uh, the place is called Kameska Chuka, which is earlier than Bresto, probably a century or two, um, is made out of stone and it has two stories. This is the earliest two-story stone building in the Balkans. So we believe that uh, the people who lived in Bresto combined the, the concept of terraces with uh, the building materials used in the area. And that's how the picture which Philip presented to you emerged. The next, please. Um, <clears throat> here on the left, you can see uh, the plan for very important site, Koprivlen, uh, like uh, 30 to 40 miles to the south of Bresto, in the valley of Mesta, Nestus River. And this plan is important in, in order to give you the idea how the other contemporaneous or slightly earlier settlements did look like. So you see that buildings are curvilinear, not exactly upside though, because the uh, long walls are not entirely parallel. And you see that there is a wall running through the site, but it's neither a fortification wall because it divides the site somehow in the middle, nor a terrace wall because it has two faces. So a, a terrace has a platform and this wall has two faces. In Kuprivlen, we have also uh, important Mycenaean pottery uh, and very important mud bricks. This is the northern more uh, point, the northern most settlement, which this Aegean Anatolian Near Eastern building material occurs. The next, please. And if we want to look for parallels of the fortification walls, we uh, will have to move a little bit eastward in the Rhodopis, uh, and we'll find um, a very good example in Adatepe. This is the uh, left slide. Uh, Adatepe 
is also quite important because it is the earliest gold mine in Europe. Um, it started in the 15th century BC. Um, probably people stopped uh, to quarry for gold already in the 15th century, but two subsequent settlements existed until the 12th, 11th century BC. And the discovery of these uh, uh, golden mines, which were uh, very well excavated, huge rescue excavation project, uh, kind of opened our eyes uh, and uh, explained why there is so much happening in the Rodopi uh, and not in the fertile river valleys during the late Bronze Age. And, and this is how we explain <clears throat> the appearance of Mycenaean pottery much further north in the Rhodopian mountains than along the Marmara, the Sea of Marmara, for example, or uh, in the fertile river valleys of uh, Maritza, Evros, or Struma Strimon. And also the fortification walls, which we find in other settlement in the Rodopi like Dragoina or uh, Tuka, uh, which might be slightly later than Bresto or also other sites. The next please. So after having seen the evidence from Bresto and also some context show evidence from the broader area, we can come back to our entering questions. Um, is this massive fortification wall and the uh, investment of uh, terracing and architecture the result of stratification and concentration of power? Or could we take this a sign of a communal effort? So, we go for the first possibility. The next, please. And um, according to this very classical way of thinking, which marked archaeological theory in the second half of the 20th century, where the social stratification and where, when the appearance of uh, inequality and also of early states were one of the favorite topic of uh, prehistoric archaeologists, then we can say, okay, we see that... <clears throat> and they say I got... uh, we see that uh, there were some hotspots of concentration of power and someone, the Lord from the site, Bresto or Dragoina or another place, uh, had to fortify this settlement in order to demonstrate the power and also to protect this power. And one of the sources of this power could be uh, gold. We don't have direct evidence, um, but another source could be control of traffic. Imagine caravans crossing the mountains and paying some tribute to the Lord of Bresto. The other way of thinking is a little bit the opposite. So according to this scenario, uh, we don't have a central power, but rather a well-working community. Uh, and this well-working community um, is well working because of these common construction projects, uh, which are kind of consolidating them. And according to these scenarios, they didn't control, they didn't force the caravans to pay taxes, but tried to attract them, to bring them to Bresto uh, in order to get the business running. And we believe that uh, Exactly the, um, the, the parallels with the terrace walls of the Macedonian terracites may have created a feeling of something new, you know, a feeling of familiarness 
and maybe another argument for these caravans to choose the valley of Mesta, to choose the inn of Bresto and not uh, another site to stay or to take the route which was uh, marked by, by another site. So this was a glimpse on the main questions which uh, we are trying to answer in this project. And we hope that uh, when we continue to work this summer, uh, we will shed some more light on uh, this uh, fascinating and long list of questions. Um, the project would have not been possible without our nice team. Uh, and that's why we want to uh, take all the institutions uh, and all the people who uh, are working with you in Bresto. And also uh, to thank you for your attention. So now it's time for discussion. <clears throat> Um, as I said, we would love to to see and hear you, <clears throat> but if you would prefer to to use the chat, um, you can do so. So you can ask about about the site, about the topic of our talk. But if you're interested to participate in the feedback, you can also ask us practical questions. So we are open for any kind of questions that you have with regard to Breast, you know, be them scientifically or be with regard to our future work this year at the site. Uh, but hey, my uh, Zoe, good evening. Let us hear your voice and see your face, if this is possible. Zoe Tirzoni from the French Research Foundation. Hello, hello, Bogdan hello. and Philip. I'm uh, very pleased to see you both. Uh, and thank you very much for this uh, uh, very uh, dense <laughs> presentation. Um, I was hoping uh, that we would hear even more uh, <laughs> and see uh, more things. It's, it was great. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, learned things that I didn't know, although I follow your works uh, uh, since uh, several years now. And uh, I have um, two questions. Well, actually more, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Let's start with uh, two small questions. Um, I think I had read in one of your uh, previous reports uh, something about the way of the technique of building of the terrace wall, which would be uh, a mixed technique with uh, uh, stone foundation and uh, mud and clay upper structure. Have I understood correctly? Uh, have you, have I understood wrongly? Or is this something that you have revised now and you consider that the wall was entirely yeah. built with stones? So the, the terrace wall of the first phase of the 13th century, what we have is this, we showed this, you know, it's now, let's say up to 1.4 meters preserved. Uh, what we, what we don't know is exactly how it was in the upper part. You know, that what we see is that when the destruction of phase one occurred, we have a package of burned wall plaster in front of this terrace wall that was falling down. So, you know, so, so there are two possibilities. Possibility one, there was some kind of wooden palisade with mud in the front, you know, or whatever. I mean, we don't have any, we have, you know, it's a it's like a destruction deposit, you know, that obviously was what you can see strategically falling down from the terrace wall to the area in front of the terrace wall. Possibility one, as I said, some kind of palisade, wooden upper structure, no burnt mud bricks. That's interesting. So we don't have any evidence for mud bricks as we have at at the side of um, of um, Kobrivlen, sorry. Uh, otherwise, there's also the possibility that when the site burned down, we see that they basically leveled the, uh, the site immediately to rebuild it. You know, there's also a possibility that they just pushed all the rubbish of the burnt buildings from top of the terrace in front of the terrace. Well, this is what you 
could do in order to get rid of it. So at the moment, I could just say, I don't know. We don't know. You know, we have both possibilities and that what is our state. So there is a chance that there was a, a wooden wooden clay superstructure that was built up like the houses, you know, with mm -hmm. wooden beams and some meshwork or whatever, or it's the rubbish from the destroyed houses that was just pushed in front of the terrace wall. So I would say this is our current state of interpretation of the evidence. And Okay, and this would be for the wall or the first phase? For the first phase. For the second phase, we have zero idea because, you know, it was just 10 centimeters below the ground. It's we really, really would have loved to know, Zoe, how high it was, how, I mean, it's clear it was high, you know, but no clear evidence. Mm -hmm. but, but if we speak of the, of the terrace wall, uh, of the first phase, Zoe, um, what might be interesting for you is that we have buildings in front of the terrace wall. And this might be an argument against imagining like a substructure on the terrace wall, like a fortification wall or something. I, 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 I'm not sure I understood the I fact understood. that, you, so that you, there you, are houses you, in front of the terrace. In yes, which there way? are houses in front of the terrace wall. Okay. Wall. So whatever that means. And, and these houses were then built over by the later fortification wall. So we see that, you know, obviously the terrace wall was not for fortification, but the later wall, you know, this was really a massive <laughs> fortification wall. So one, one almost gets the, in, the idea that in the 13th century, they were happily living in a possibly rather not fortified site on this hill. And then mm -hmm. only after its destruction, the community immediately now we need definitely a fortification wall. So, I mean, of course, we don't know. Maybe there was also in phase one some kind of fortification that's closer to the river and it's not preserved, you know. But at least we see houses built in front of the terrace wall. Okay. Uh, just to close this uh, discussion mm -hmm. about the, the, the building technique, um, at um, the site of uh, Dikilitash where we excavate, which is less than... Uh, uh 90 kilometers maybe from uh, from Bristol uh to the south um we do have this uh on top of the tell uh, uh a terrace wall which seems uh to be built with stone foundation and uh, a clay upper structure um and uh i gave uh, we have published it uh, with uh, citing as parallel <laughs> your Bresto <laughs> example. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, it would be okay. Uh, no, it's also interesting really? in terms of uh, this merging of uh, concept, uh, architectural con concept of building <laughs> with mud brick from, as you saw, from uh, uh, Tumba, Thessalonikis, and the stone architecture tradition. So it, it is interesting to see how this, uh, uh, this combination of techniques potentially work uh, uh, in, the two, in the two areas. I think I will skip my second question right, right now to leave the talk no, to, someone, on, to someone else and eventually come back. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> But but uh, but uh, your question and uh, the reference to Dikilitash is very important because um, to 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 give some idea uh, uh, for people who are not familiar, this is a tell site which started earlier, and it is easier to understand that in the late Bronze Age, the 13th, the 12th century, 14th century BC, you would make this effort to terrace it in order to create the most possible space on this small hill, because for some reason you want to make the connection to the past, to the uh, your parents, to la la la. So they are, <laughs> this is easy to understand. But why do you need this effort to start from scratch on this quite steep hill, which is, as P Philip said, in the middle of nowhere. So in these mountains, there are such nicer places, places to live. They are valleys with hot spring water, uh, with uh, 
agricultural areas and hills, which are kind of flanking these areas. Why to do these terraces in Bresto? So this comparison to between tell sites and mm -hmm. what we see in the mountains is important to to understand. Uh, if, if, I, Thank if, you. I'm, if I may add to this, so if you came as a merchant or a caravan from the south, knowing the tell sites of Thessaloniki and Dikilitat, and you went to Bresto, you know, the optic impression of Bresto was very similar to a tell site. You know, mm -hmm. so basically it was a bit of a familiarity. You know, you see a slope in terraces building on top of it. You know, it, it, it was familiar in the way of, you know, basically in the sense, Presto looked like a tell site without being a tell, you know, <laughs> like, so it is very fascinating. We, we almost got the, the idea at some point, maybe they wanted to create something that from an optical point of view looked similar to the tell sites you know, of the Northern Aegean. That's a pure speculation, but we are still struggling with the question, why on earth do you go to this slope and make all this effort, you know? And we see this connectedness. So this is something, I think that's why we say Brest is full of questions and, and surprises, you know? Boris, Borisov, please. You can unmute yourself, Boris, Boris, and, and ask a question. Yes, hello, Hi, Council speaking. So, um, you know, when, uh, here in uh, our group here uh, uh, within the Bulgarians, uh, in our team, uh, as Bogdan was talking about the uh, yeah, um, many floor buildings for the first time in, uh, in Bresto, it, it, it can um, consider only a stone architecture then. And then we were asking ourselves, Bob, when you were working in Durantola with buildings, wasn't there any discussion that there's also a two floor building? Um, thank you. Uh, so, because the quality of the sound was not good, I will uh, uh, repeat it. This is uh, Professor Reiko Kraus from the University of Tübingen. Uh, and if I understood the question correctly, um, it is that not all of the buildings in Bresto had stone foundations. This is correct. Um, and then that we have stone foundations also further north. Durankulak is a site from the same time, 13th, 12th century BC, on the Black Sea coast in the Dobroja. So it's like 10 kilometers from the Bulgarian-Romanian border. And what we see there are stone foundations, but it's just a stone foundation. That means that uh, mm, probably the, the upper structure was rather uh, a tent-like, a uh, very light upper structure, I would say. But we don't need to go so far to the north. We have a very important site for, from this time in the basin of Sofia. Uh, Philip show you the mountains of uh, Pirin to the south of Bresto, Rila to the north of Bresto, then you have another small mountain, Vitusha, and then you have this basin of Sofia. And um, uh, it's uh, called Chepinci, and there we have again some uh, stone socos, some stone foundation of much bigger uh, houses, not upside down, I would say horseshoe like. Uh, uh, so big structures. This means that, and, and we have also stone foundations in the in the Carpathians, uh, uh, and even uh, much more if you go to the north. Uh, but this massive use of stone for the uh, terracing is what uh, we don't have parallels from other places. There was also a question if there were two story, two floor buildings at Rankula, but probably Bogdan in the church. The, the... Ah, okay. Uh, no, no. The 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 way the the foundations of of the houses, the stone foundations of the houses in Durankula, but also in all the other places from the inner part of the Balkans, looks um, peaks of rather light light roof construction. I could not imagine a second floor. 
Um, I see. Further questions. Ah, uh, Elena, please. Nice Elena, to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. I don't switch my camera because I'm traveling in the moment, but I had the chance to listen to this uh, so exciting presentation. Thank you to the both of you. Um, I have one uh, question uh, related with this yeah, cultural affiliations of the site. Uh, what we see in the food uh, economy, uh, which they have, is very strong connection with the Aegean and Northern Greece. So this what we know from the other late Bronze Age sites uh, as a picture in Bulgaria. Uh, is uh, only partly visible in Brest. We have a lot of free threshing wheat, which appears much later in Bulgaria. So it could be that, uh, yeah, these people trading there are also uh, culturally more related uh, with the South, when I think the food is important uh, element. Uh, is it a chance that uh, there were, I don't know, like, uh, people coming from Aegean who went to exploit all the resources in the mountain. And I don't know, related with the locals, but also that they somehow use the hinterland. Well, it's, um, I think you're the best one to answer your question because you're the one who knows uh, the best what happens with uh, uh, food in, in the other late, late Bronze Age sites. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so there are only, uh, how to say, hullet weeds, and here we have those which appear much later in the other sites in Bulgaria. Yes. And for me, this is one hint that there is something special. I thought that, yeah, it could be also a hypothesis to follow. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, but um, the question is, um, can we speak of uh, imported food as I think this was the case probably in some of the, the southern species in Adatepe or was this uh, locally grown? So uh, in Adatepe we had a lot of pigs indeed, here we don't have much but this free threshing with the bread wheat Mm -hmm. uh, which appears in the early Iron Age in Adatepe. Here we have it already in these burnt uh, layers, uh, so in the first phase. Uh, I think probably we need to do isotopic analysis or something uh, to trace if it yeah, was Yeah, we have to do but, this, Elena. We but this is a this. staple crop, uh, so usually this is not something what you can, uh, what you need to improve, uh, import much. And it can be grown in the surrounding yeah yeah um, elena what i what i think is very interesting about the site is exactly what you said that it's on the one hand this deep connection to the south with regard to food with imports with architecture but it also has a lot of connections to the north you know if you look at the pottery we get the we get a, or in the 13th century already this kind of channel pottery you know that is usually associated with influences from the north rather the south you know we have we have um no wheel made pottery, all pottery is handmade, you know, uh, with the exception of this one, Alabastron, that was imported from the Thessaloniki area. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is really that Presto seems to be in, in a place of interaction, you know, uh, basically a, a contact space, you know, where, where all this happened. And I think this makes the site also so interesting, you know, because why do certain things point to the south and others point to the north? You know, why do we have these changes? And this is something that is, of course, in the focus of our interest at the moment. You know, I, before I, before we excavated Bresto, we were always very interested in intercultural encounter. And this was also the, one of the points when we started in Bresto, we always thought, you know, these areas in Southern Bulgaria were often seen as remote, you know, people have called it, this is the periphery, whatever periphery means, you know. And then we thought maybe it would be more just to, to get away from core and periphery and rather speak of a network and see the the agency and the creativity of the people at Bresto in between north and south, you know, and developing their own strategy, be it food, be it pottery, be it architecture. And I think what, what you just said is one of these fascinating aspects, how people lived at Bresto in between the north and the south. And which are the places uh, to which they were connected in the north? I am yeah, it's not good archaeologists. 
uh, I'm very curious about this. Indeed, yes, thank you, Elena. Um, th there is a question in the chat uh, from our dear colleague, Sorin Ailinkai from uh, Tulcha, from the museum in Tulcha, and I will read it. Do you have any proof of relations with lower Danube or Carpathian Basin civilizations? or Bresto has only southern connections? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, so uh, when we speak about north and south, we have to take into consideration that the Aegean is like 80 miles, 80, 90 miles to the south as the crow flies, whereas the lower Danube is, uh, I would say, 200 and Carpathians even further. Um, so um, what we have, and it comes definitely from the north, is this Gava type of pottery. Uh, so, uh, and it's very difficult to say whether it was brought by people or whether this is a new, uh, a new style which gets uh, uh, which gets in fashion in the Balkans in the in the 13th century already in the 13th century BC. If, um, if I, yeah. Yes. If I may add on this, um, it's interesting that these kind of upsidal buildings are something that appear from Transylvania. You know, the excavation of my Munich colleague Karola Metzenebelsik have also encountered upsidal buildings in Lapush in in Romania, and this goes down to Greece. You know, as we showed in our 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 um, our um, presentation, this is also something that is found to the north, but also in this case to the south. So nothing that links only to the north. One also needs to say that to the north, the second millennium is much worse study than it is to the south. You know, thanks to our colleagues in working in northern Greece, you know, we know much more about late Bronze Age in northern Greece than we know about settlements of the late Bronze Age in the area, let's say, of northern Bulgaria, if I may say, Bogdan. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, but uh, um, to come back to the question about the north, um, there was uh, these interesting finds from Castanas made by Bertrand Henzo, this Noah type of pins uh, published by uh, Alex Hochstetter. So there is no doubt that objects moved also from north to uh, south. And of course, we have the Uluburun scepter, uh, for those who are not familiar, a stone scepter found in the uh, shipwreck of Uluburun, which is definitely of Eastern Black Sea type. So Eastern Bulgaria, uh, Western Black Sea, this would be Eastern Bulgaria, Southeast Romania, uh, which means that uh, there was definitely a traffic of objects. Uh, I guess that we do not recognize so well the pottery which comes from the north. It's much more difficult to identify then, for example, a will made my senior shirt. There's a chat, uh, the question chat by Jeffrey Brown. I read it out. Is the evidence of structures at the summit? And have you have any arrowheads in the excavation material from the main walls? So with regard to the structures in the summit, we are in the sad and happy situation that looters of the 1990s have uh, transformed Presto in a Swiss cheese, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so even before starting the excavation, we could clearly see the extent of the settlement. I can say yes, they also had a looter's trench at the very top of the summit where they found I mean, what we still see, and they found something probably more interest. You know, we found pottery of the late Bronze Age, we found architectural remains. So we can really say, yes, the whole slope up to the present day summit was covered by architecture. With regard to arrowheads, we have arrowheads from the settlement, but no arrowheads now sticking in the main walls. You know, something that you have at some sites where you see there was some fierce conflict, you know. So we have arrowheads, but not in the in the walls. And of course, if you have arrowheads, you can use them for killing people, but you can also use them for hunting. And hunting obviously played a very important role at Presto. So as, as we... Unfortunately, we have no idea how these two phases at Presto both ended. You know, were the neighboring people that thought 
I'm not a big friend of Presto, so let's burn it down. Or was it someone, you know, who was very, it was a hot summer day and you, you shouldn't have used the hearth got fire and then the building burned down and then the settlement got fire, you know. The only thing is what we know is that in both cases, it, it must have been extreme temperature when the site burned burned down because otherwise we wouldn't have these tons of burnt wall plaster and I think this is due to breasts on the slope so there must have been something like a chimney effect a chimney effect that that made the fire at both times so hot that these complete walls were burned at high temperatures this is it's very unusual that that you have complete walls burned at such a high temperature so it must have really been this chimney effect that burned down Bresto two times to such an extent but if this was because of a hostile attack or some kind of unhappy other event, we really don't know what happened. So the only thing what we can say is after the first phase, the community at Presto worked well, very well. They immediately rebuilt. So there was a big resilience. And they obviously the community was not, let's say, killed or suffered too much or was deported. They had the power to immediately build Presto again with at least the same splendid architecture or even more splendid. And after the second phase, Bresto was left. And the next thing that we get is 500 years later, some Iron Age pits that destroy all the evidence, you know. So Bresto was maybe by some herders, pastoralists coming at some times to Bresto, but no real architecture anymore. So it's really interesting, you know. So we have this after the first destruction, immediately rebuilding, probably no mass killing or whatever. And then after the second destruction, everyone leaves Presto or did not survive. We don't know. But we have only we have, we have fragments of one human skull in small pieces, um, which we couldn't date, was too much burned. We don't know if primary or secondarily, but we don't have any you know, victims that one would expect if there would have been a hostile attack and people were, would have been left there but this is was at least there's no evidence for for such a hostile attack at Bresto which even makes it more interesting why the site burned down two times are there more questions we are happy also if there's some organizatorial questions that we are, we are most happy to have you with us those that that want to learn more about Bresto in in July and August this year okay last chance if not, then I would like to thank you for attending and also to wish you a very successful season this summer uh, and to hope to see you on our next uh, lecture in the framework of the Balkan Heritage and New Bulgarian University co-organized seminar. Bye. Thank thanks, everybody. Nice much. to have you on the call. Bye-bye.